It's hard. Um, so my name is Emma. I do housing justice organizing in Atlanta. I'm trying to span that work outside of Atlanta. Uh, I went to school here, so I know like how bad the housing problem is, especially for people who are legacy residents and just normal people who are trying to live here and are not college students bawling on their parents' budget. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe we could have a chat and then I could talk about some resources I can offer everyone and maybe um, not some resources to support the work you are already doing and give you greater capacity. So um, we will, uh, yeah, I don't want to like, talk the whole time. So I was hoping we could kind of talk about some of the problems in Athens. Um, have done a lot of reading about studentification, um, you know, essentially that they're building these luxury student housing and leaving residents who are from here out in the streets. Hi, Sarah. Hey. How are you? Um, we you know we have a two-year waiting list for public housing here. Our fair market rate is 80% higher than the rest of the state, and it's risen 61%. You know, we have the not sustainable Airbnbs and ADUs, that kind of thing, exclusionary zoning. These are just some of the things that I'm concerned about. I'm interested in hearing what you are concerned about. So I would like to have more of a discussion style, also because I hate presenting. So thoughts, what are, we, what are we mad about? Let's have a bitch session. What are we mad about? The fact that we can't build ADUs, I can spell that. Yes. And I see that too as like a right to property. I think there's a really interesting nonpartisan, smaller government. You can't tell me what to do with my property there. I'm, I'm going to build something, and I was like, I'm yes. trying to do. I have I have a very busy Airbnb. It's in my house, okay. like old school way. But you know, but I'm but I'm like you know missing middle. You know, provide housing close to campus because I, I I bought my house like. Back when you could buy a house for that yeah. fortune. Um, but you know, talking to the people planning, I'm like, okay, fine, I'm just building an art studio. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. you oh no, the induction stuff, and I'm just like, forget it, we're just building a studio. And, and for everyone who's going first, <laughs> in, a really nice we I know that ADU is not going to eventually, so like probably happens when you go to what an ADU is. That's an accessory dwelling unit. And in Athens, you can only, you can't build an accessory dwelling unit that has a full kitchen in it. Um, basically, you can't take your property and build a, a house that your children could live in, or maybe your aging parents, or um, you want some rental income. You can't do that by right in Athens. So, uh, a lot in a lot of places, a way to gently increase density is by allowing people to build a second unit on their property um, and care for family members or whatnot in that property. And in Athens, that is not legal. Yeah, what's up? I get a slight correction on that. <laughs> we do allow something that we call guest suites. <laughs> they are the same dimensions as what the ADU would be. You just cannot have the full cooktop. So some people can get around that with the induction stove and other kinds of things. But there are words. You can, put, you can put the structure there. You just cannot put a full stove cooktop. Yes, Adams defines kitchen, full kitchen, as having a stove. Right. So, and <laughs> This hand was up first, so I'm going to go with that. Well, yeah. I mean, we, we, it's almost like we're talking about both sides of the We want to solve the housing problem, but we always get to with all these things we can't do. Why can't we have full kitchen in here? <laughs> yes. right wow, there. some great yeah, questions. I don't mean this to be pointed at you. There are a lot of things I don't like. It was up to him. I, 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 there, there, are lot, there are several things. There are a lot of things I like about the dog. I don't like the fact that if I own a lot, I can't put a single wide modular unit on that lot it has to be double wide. I don't like that. I mean, yes. because I have some seniors who want, who own property, want to put a, a unit on it, but they don't want a double wide. It's too mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of, you, we're, we're going at this and we're talking like out of both sides. We want to fix the housing issue, but you can't do this, you can't do that. I mean, for me, for me, for me, I, I, I mean, I bought 30 acres so I could control what's around me. 
outside of the third entrance, I don't think I have a say mm -hmm. what's built next door to me. Okay? But there are people that drive, they only want to see houses that look like theirs, mm -hmm. and they only want to see neighborhoods that look like theirs, but yet they want to be on a formal housing committee. That doesn't work like that. You need to run for county commission. Yeah. You need to run for county this commission. You're making a well, lot of I'm, sense I'm just, over there. I'm just, tell, I'm just telling you that either Athens Clark County is going to change their zoning or they're going to get sued. Mm -hmm. And it's coming. I'm just tell you it is. Sarah, right. what's up? Hey, um, thank you all for being here. Hey, Daryl. Um, <laughs> on time. Just, I, this, is, this is a great time. I'm so excited. Um, but go, uh, going off of that and going off of the conversation about ADUs is related to another thing that I've been thinking about kind of constantly, which is the fact that in like what how much how much of our land is done to single family residential? Thirty percent. Thirty percent. Um, and there's another thirty-ish percent in agricultural residential, which only allows. It's the rural area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So together you have about two thirds of the county where a single family home is about the only thing you can do. Uh, and and then like 52,000 units could be built left? I don't in available know. land? Yeah. I think it is. Uh, so two thirds, two -thirds of, the, of the land in this county is single family zoned. And anywhere that's single family zoned, and correct me if this is wrong for agricultural residential, but I think that it is, uh, it holds there too. You can only have two unrelated people living together in two thirds of the land in this county. So yeah. like if you're an adult person and you want two roommates, you're, you're out of luck. And of course we all know that that law is not followed. Um, and it is enforced. It's 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 enforced. And a lot of people, I've, I've discovered, don't even know that it exists. So a lot of people will like, uh, I was talking to a woman today who rents out two rooms in her home, and she didn't know that she was what she was doing was breaking the law. Um, and she happens to have neighbors who uh, aren't snitching on her. Um, <laughs> but that, um, but you know, most people don't know about this. But to me, that's a prime example of something to be changed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if you got five people living, if you get them off the street, you put them in a room somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. It's one of the strictest uh, requirements in the whole country because back in like 2003 when I met Russell and <laughs> you know we're, we're all like up in arms like stop the rental registration because that was how they were going to actually enforce this two person unrelated thing mm -hmm. and and they were serious like we're going to do this and anyway I ended up doing this survey of planning departments all over the country oh, and wow. we were in like the top 10 strictest of any comparable place in America back in 2003 and they ended up striking it down as unconstitutional as they have in other places but yeah it's insane I'm kind of like okay, you guys are all like Athens music scene I'm like that was like communal living people living together yeah. playing in bands oh, yeah. sharing housing expenses well and I you mean know? you mentioned the art studio so the group in Atlanta that I work with was kind of thinking about a similar thing doing project advocacy for like an art studio type where four or five people could live come together work on their creative endeavors whatever that looks like and have this shared living space. But again, are we really letting the municipal government and our neighbors tell us what to build on our own property? There we go. That's right? Not, that's the question. Are we letting them or are they telling us? Well, yes. But they're, telling. they're telling us, but I think that we could change that. I think we need to um, change that. I think, yeah, we need to change that. Tell us how to change it. Okay, so a couple things um, that I can offer. So we have had some very creative solutions in Atlanta. One of our developers who also does a bunch of like fair and affordable housing research. Um, so he only develops not like not for profit affordable housing units, which is super cool. And he found that he could not get an ADU on this piece of property. But Atlanta still had laws about servants' quarters. So he told the city of Atlanta, I will be building a servants' quarters on this property so that he could get it done, right? Which is like so up, right? Like that's nasty. So but I think it says something, right? I think it says something that he was creative enough to find a different approach, but also in that way point out, well, look at these like extremely awful outdated laws we have, Sarah. 
I um, I know I came in a few minutes late, so I'm sorry if if I missed something. Um, have <laughs> have, um, have you had a chance to tell everyone like what your organization is? I wanted to hear some of the concerns, and I was saying, like, I would love to talk about what I can offer in yeah. terms of support, but I wanted to be sure that everyone's, like, concerns, and, you know, I was yeah. really, I, you know, I did some of the research, but really understanding, you know, especially, like, some of the cons uh, some of the local thoughts and whatnot before we delve into anything. Okay, cool. So I was like, let's have a bitch session, first <laughs> off. Um, I'll take a couple more hands, and then we'll keep the conversation moving. What's up? My, question, my thing is... Um... Why do we allow these people to regulate us, but they don't regulate corporations? Great question. Uh, great. I am also wondering this. Um, yeah, there. I mean, there. And even um, again, I'm going to refer back to Atlanta. So Atlanta right now is having. Locals' homes, like, you know, families of four or five, appraised at 100% of the worth, right? So these homes are being really expensive. But the properties that are owned by really big corporations like Google are only being appraised at half or less of their worth so that they're paying so much littler for these spaces. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, so just some solidarity there to point out that this is definitely happening across the state. Uh, one, one of my concerns is in Athens, 30% of your residents are on some type of rental assistance, right? Mm -hmm. But the units that are available and the units that are being built don't reflect that 30%. Right. They're all market rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're going market rate. So you're going to get into a situation kind of like Atlanta where the people that work here and used to stay here are going to get pushed Somewhere. outside of Athens. They don't have to live outside of Athens and drive into Athens to work. That's what's coming. Yeah. If we don't, if we don't do something about it. I push back on that a little bit. Just push that back. Push back. Because if you look around the country at places that are building market rate units really quickly, they have lowered their rental rates way more than anyone else. Because when you increase supply enough, rents on all the other units decrease. So even though the new units may not be affordable, the rents on the older units decrease when new units I, I understand. And something I think wait, that's... Wait, wait, that. oh, I, sorry. I understand it. I hear that argument, but the growth rate of the university is matching the growth rate of, of units here in Athens. Yeah. So your scenario which, will never which, catch up. Which I brought up. In the land, the land Use Steering Committee, UGA mm -hmm. came presented to us, the planner, and I asked her, what is your plan for housing all of these new students? And she got very angry with it. Uh, okay, okay, so. And what you would look for your other The problem is, is we, got, we got UGA students competing for open market rentals right. all throughout Adams Clark County. Well, and that's why the market rates have gone up so much. Because of that, we have one of the highest rental rates east of the Mississippi. Yes. Right yeah. here in Adams Clark County. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, that's like what I was saying earlier that the 9th District by Loma has a lot of landmass. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to keep us from getting sewage so they can get that landmass. To me, that's what I think they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, you build a new apartments over here, right behind, right up the new Mason, over across from McDonald's. You got McDonald's behind McDonald's. Then you cross over the highway behind Culver's. You got apartments and, and, and townhouses over there, yeah. but then you're going to tell me that they're behind there that you're not going to, you're not going to put sewage in there for the next 25 years. I have a problem with that. Yeah, I get that. I was just going to say one thing, but first, you let that one person, another conglomerate, competing for housing is their right. For sure. Yeah, oh, for sure. Alumni yeah. buying houses just have party houses. Oh, yeah. But first, which just strengthens your argument, actually. Uh, I own a house. Okay. Small house that Very I rent. Cool. Yes, it's wonderful. I bought it before the prices went crazy here in Athens. Here in Athens. And yeah, I want to put a room in It's $1,200 for a two bedroom house on Ruth Street for 900 square feet. Oh, Ruth Street. Ruth Street. Yeah, that's, that's a good deal. deal. That's yes, a good deal. Yeah. Congrats to the homeowners. Well, thank you. But I called when my taxes have two bedrooms, two bedrooms. Two bedroom, one bath. Oh. Um, but when my tax one bath has gone up mm -hmm. from 1500 yeah. to this last time assessed to 3400 and I called to contestants and said, I am trying as a responsible owner and a citizen of this community to offer right. affordable rent. So I think something that you could look into too is incentivizing homeowners and Airbnb people with something with the county 
to be transparent yeah. in what your rent is, and if you're offering affordable rent to non-students, to actual people who are Absolutely. in the working community. Absolutely. Whether that's a tax incentive or a tax credit or something, because I was like, right now, the tax in homeowners insurance is 35% mm -hmm. or 40%. Like, I don't need to make a ton of money off this, but I need to cover some stuff. I'm gonna to try to keep the conversation moving, um, but I will say, I will say, I think what we're talking about here, right? This is like a really multi-pronged, intersectional issue. But the horror and beauty of that is that there's going to be a lot of different approaches that we can take to solve these issues, right? Like it is an upward battle, you know. Um, but there are a lot of avenues to give shots to, right? Um, Sarah, I saw you aggressively raising your hand, so I want to... Oh, no, no. Uh, no, you're moving the conversation forward. I love that. Uh, we will, um, uh, after after Emma uh, tells us a little bit more about their their group and like what their group does, and we hear some different kinds of solutions, maybe, I, uh, I, I, I don't know when they're kicking us out of this room, but we can absolutely return to the open discussion if it steps in, I think. Yeah, yeah. But... Good opening. I have learned something for sure. Um, I'm glad to hear everybody's concerns, of course. Um, so just like some steps that I saw as possible avenues, um, housing proposal advocacy. So one big thing that we've had luck with in Atlanta is when we have someone come to us and say, hi, I am building 55 units. 30% of them are going to be affordable in this style. In Atlanta specifically, they have neighborhood planning units that have to approve these projects before the city council approves them. My job is to organize people to go to their neighborhood planning units and say, yes, I want this in my area. I want this more dense housing, right? So it actually gets to city hall so we can get a start on it. Um, of course, part of that is then you bump into all of the red flags around actually getting approvals. So right now we are actually working with the mayor's office and these are like slow conversations but head in the right direction about condensing a lot of the permitting process specifically into the buildings unit so that we have more efficient government because right now some of these structures or not structures but like the, the, the basis of them right are sitting out in the rain for six to eight weeks while people are also still not living in homes right so what are we doing to get the permitting process more efficient on that side of things. Of course, a lot of it is gonna be about the narrative, right? I mean, the numbers are always important, but the narrative kind of makes the numbers come to life for a lot of people. So we try to do a lot of press, we try to get it out there. And I think what's been really cool is that at the DNC this year, and kind of for the first time ever, housing has really been a big conversation there. And that's a huge stage, right? Like we have Kamala Harris talking about housing. Personal opinions aside, that's a huge deal, right? Um, so just calling attention to it. Of course, lobbying for better local laws in Atlanta. No one is proposing local laws, so we are proposing legislation. Um, just plugging into, you know, state and federal, uh, you know, levels too. Uh, any, you know, advocacy there, whether we're, you know, emailing our senators, that kind of thing. Of course, building coalitions, right? Like, what does it look like statewide to come together? to have people from Atlanta and from Athens and from Savannah talk about, well, this is happening in my city, right? And not only is there some solidarity in that, like, I don't know, when someone else is also struggling, I'm like, oh, oh, it's okay, I'm also struggling, that's good. Um, and of course, like, if we have pro-housing candidates, I know we have some cool people that sit on city council right now, hopefully we could have some more cool people, right, activating for those candidates. Um, so these are just like a couple things that I see be successful in Atlanta. Um, can I make a sure. You have to be careful when you say we're going to have pro housing candidates, because we have pro housing candidates. We have pro housing builders around Atlanta, right. but they're just building market rate housing. Right. So market rate yeah. housing leaves people out. It leaves that thirty percent out that I'm talking about. Yeah. And you have to be careful when you say affordable. What definition are we using for affordable? Mm -hmm. Are we using 80% AMI, and what AMI are we using? Are we using HUD's AMI, which for this rate, in Athens Clark County is like $104,000, yes. or are we using Athens Clark County AMI, which is $54,000? Mm -hmm. So you, you, you kind of have to really be specific when you say affordable and right, of nail it down. Of course, and, and I think the beauty in a lot of that is the diversity of what's being built, right? Like at the end of the day, there are going to be people that can afford market rate housing. 
If we only build that, it is going to shove other people out, and that is not fair. However, if we are building mixed income, that missing middle, are we, you know, are a percentage of these units going to be affordable, and the other percentage going to be market rate? If we have a diversity, not only in the cost of these units, but in also the type of units, is this a duplex? Is this a fourplex? Is this an apartment building? Right? Is this a home with an apartment? basement, you know, a diversity in the kinds of, you know, rent you're going to pay, mortgage you're going to pay, and a diversity in like the actual building types. Again, you are tapping that problem from all prongs, right? It wouldn't be fair just to build market rate housing, especially not here, right? That's what they do. I'm that's not, not, not right, and that's, and that's, that's, what's, that's what's happening. I'm telling yeah. you. Is it yeah. so? Because yeah. I know there is a lot of affordable housing being built, like the Bethel Street development. Um, isn't that like seven? Um, I would like to. I, I would like to. Like to yeah. What is the legal definition of affordable housing? Is it legal or is it a marketing thing? Okay, I would. I would like to. I would like to uh, add please, something please. to because we're just we're 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 fully in the conversation right now of does building new housing help anyone? Right. We're having that. We're having the question of if it is not government subsidized buildings. Does that help anyone? And it's a conversation that comes up over and over again in uh, anytime, anytime something new is getting built, it's going to come up again when we're talking about the future land use. Um, and so we're just kind of having that out. Um, one thing that I would like to uh, add, add to the mix from what you're saying, um, I guess uh, just a quick question, show of hands. Um, who here has, ha has, handled housing vouchers in some way. Whether you had one, you're a landlord, you were helping someone who had a housing voucher. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, when you're thinking about, uh, ha when you're thinking about the housing voucher, and you know, I don't wanna um, make you talk about yourself any more than you want to. Um, when you're thinking about a housing voucher, where do you think those housing vouchers get used? Where do you think of them being used? Where do I think they? Yeah, like what kind of housing? I mean, this day and age, they can go anywhere. Yeah. And I mean, that's the way it should be. Yeah. I mean, you 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 could, I mean, you could be living in Brookside, you could be living out by Kroger, and you don't know who's on housing voucher, and that's the right. way it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. And the the whole point of the housing vouchers. Uh, the, the voucher system, yeah, the, the whole way it was created rate. was, uh, and you know, with Brookside, you've got you've got some project based stuff where it's like mixed income, which is also mm -hmm. what we're talking about doing at Bethel. Um, but the other voucher system, the which which we have put a lot of money into as a government, the entire idea was that you should be able to use it like rent, on in market rate housing, uh, and so a lot of the housing money that, that comes down from the top is meant to be used in market rate housing. Um, so I think that when we talk about like what is affordable housing, what is housing for people who have low income or are using vouchers, it should be anything. And I think that what we've seen or what, what, what we do see, and I, uh, I will open this up uh, afterwards to any thoughts, um, is when, when there's a lot of competition for units, right? When we don't have enough new housing for the students, when we don't have enough new housing for the young professionals or whoever, the new families that are moving in for whatever, the landlords, uh, your typical landlord will, if they have an option between someone using a voucher and someone who is paying cash, not using a voucher, no they, they're not gonna take the voucher. Uh, and it's just because, I won't get into the because right now, but when when the I mean a lot of different becauses um, that is one use of market rate housing, and when we have more of it, is that better for anyone? Uh, did anyone want to contribute to the conversation about about market rate housing and housing affordability? One I'll, new person. I'll just tell you all the all the vouchers get used on on the block or in trailer, Asian trailer parks. As someone who works in housing and works with homeless folks, like trying to get someone out of the woods and put them, you know, in a rough neighborhood, 
rougher neighborhood with more drug prevalence, like it's it's not a great environment for recovery and it makes it really hard for someone transitioning out of homelessness who may have not worked in the past few years to sustain or even consider like harm reduction, some form of like recovery or stability, maintaining employment or maintaining income to uphold their end of the rent or uphold their utilities or things like that. In, in practice, the old people only get housed with vouchers from the streets, like barring it. very few in trailer parks. Uh, I think another problem we have is, you know, it's always been the American dream is to own your own home. Well, well that dream is getting further and further and further and further and further away. Mm -hmm. Because to start a home now, they're starting out at 300. 350. And the person graduating from college, get married, and start a family, you know, they can't afford that. So, and, and it's, it's not that they can't be built, it's that if I can build five houses and on a piece of property and charge $400,000 for those houses, I'm a developer or a builder, whatever you would call it, why would I charge 250 for those houses? I'm not going to do it. And that's, I love capitalism, I take a bullet for this country, but that's just, you know, <laughs> capitalism cuts both ways. You know, it, it, if you're it, maximizing it, profit, you're leaving people out. But you could it's, maximize profit by building 10 <coughs> houses that are smaller on the same land. Oh, no, 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 I, I can't do that because zoning won't let me. Yeah. It's an RS, it's an RS. So it requires a 15,000 square foot lot. Uh -huh. Okay, well, so I'm 15,000 square foot lot. I mean, am I going to build a 250 or am I going to build a 400,000 home? I'm going to build a 400,000 home, home because I got miles to feed at the end of the day, too. Mm -hmm. And we I have to have a thousand foot minimum, which is crazy. Like I have a neighbor across the street. He wanted to build like a, a more efficient, smaller house. Oh, he did. But he had to scale it up, you know. Yeah. And, and so he legally built a, a duplex. She's like, oh, we'll have it inspected and we'll put the door, you know, close off the door after. Should you have to done. game the system Should and cheat in order to do what's right. Okay. Uh, the, the, the thing is now is just like everything is classified as. Apartment renting first and housing second. It's like it's like you rent and, and be happy. No. Yeah, I'm I'm worried about the homeowner. The, the homeowner system you know, is be, being pushed out. Yeah. You look at you look at now people complaining about the taxes, and and if you're building more apartments, more people gonna move in an apartment than you're gonna have housing. So that means who's gonna who the tax base gonna fall on those that own the home. Yeah. Well, so the, the people who right. own the apartments are also paying taxes. Yeah, they pay, they pay a tax, but you ain't going to see it because the corporation is going to, you just build new apartment. They're going to give them a tax break on it in the beginning, so you're going to lose. Okay. I want to, I, I, I want to, I want, I want to put, uh, uh, aside for right now the conversation about tax fairness, because I think that it is a very important one and also we could never get to, we could we could talk about it the entire night and never get to the end of, of talking about what we're doing here. So I do want to, um, does anyone else have uh, anything they want to contribute? What's your name, sir? Quazon Bay. Quazon. Um, I got it. This is a whole different. Okay. Story. I'm going to, I, 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 I have much to hear from you, but I, uh, if uh, someone else uh, wants to talk about the subject of market rate housing, so we can have some more out. I hear it to you, but. Yeah, I mean, I think this will apply to any of the breadth of housing issues, but I guess I'm just curious, you know, what we in this room are going to do about these things. Is, at times, it does feel like um, having been organizing here for the last seven years since student, like, and be, I'm a philosophy major. I love to get into the weeds, but I'm also not interested in, like, being a part of a debate society. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, I'm wondering what we are going to do. You know, is there a platform that we would like to develop and push, and, like, let's move toward that? That know? sounds like a great transition. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me talk more than that. <laughs> yes. We'll, 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 we'll go oh, back to the action. <laughs> So talking about some things that my group in Atlanta does. So we have a national branch that funds different chapters all over um, the United States. We started out San Francisco, Bay Area. I've never been out west. We have a chapter in Atlanta, Asheville, Nashville, Tennessee, right? So we have a lot of national structure for support. These are some of the things we are doing in Atlanta. 
Uh, right now we have a at-large city council candidate who's running. We sent out surveys. We had a forum. Over 100 people came out to listen to their elected officials talk just about housing. And we were actually able to endorse the only candidate who connected zoning as an issue to housing supply and affordability, right? So that's just, you know, one thing. Um, we've been streamlining permitting. I kind of talked about this earlier. We have people who are developers who have that niche expert knowledge that I'll be so real. I like can't even begin to comprehend um, as much as they're catching me up. They're talking to the city about, okay, well, if my DPH, right? Like it, they got the expert ideas. They've got the big brains in that room and they're using those big brains to talk to the city saying, why is it taking me over a year to get the easement approval I needed because that's ridiculous, right? Like we can't, we're not fixing a supply issue if we're just waiting for the government to make a move, right? So we want to tell them, let's get it on the road. That's something else we're doing in Atlanta. Um, a little bit just about our advocacy. So we have uh, our latest letter writing campaign. We had 422 individuals sign up, write letters, write emails to their elected officials, multiple elected officials. Um, of course, this is an avenue that like everyone knows about and everyone takes. Um, but we've also done a lot of project by project advocacy. So something we really, really did off of Moreland Ave, there was a kind of old junky motel. Turned it into a really nice percentage affordable living place. Like it is super cute. The little, it's white, it's got the blue doors, right? And it's this beautiful place that a bunch of people live. 54 affordable housing units, right? So what, it's also like, maybe we don't need to build something brand new, you know what I mean? Like the, the skeleton was good, it was more a remodel. It's a beautiful and nice place for people to live now because we were able to turn out and advocate for that. So, to come with it, uh, and I, you know, understand that maybe Yimby isn't popular, everyone, but I come with a group called Yimby Action. Uh, my chapter in Atlanta is called Abundant Housing Atlanta, and essentially our motto, we want affordable and abundant housing. Two prongs. Um, so, the chapters are really the heart. Uh, you know, we have all these resources for housing groups like this, for people who are trying to solve this crisis, but we really let people do what they will. I, I, I mean, Amani and I go back a little bit, and, you know, I've seen the organizing here and stuff, and I, I know that, you know, this city's on a good path with the good, you know, brilliant minds that are in this room. We would offer support to the work that is already happening um, but because we have a national branch, we have a bunch of stuff that we can offer you. Um, so basically, you know, we want to see like if you are concerned with affordable housing and whatnot. I don't know why I can't pull this link up. Hello? You want Yimby Action's five core solutions? Yeah, I think I've... Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you join this month, you get free swag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. I... Oh no, you guys are seeing me have tech problems. <laughs> I just want to show you the site because I think it's so nice. Um, here's our site. Legalize housing. Fund affordable housing. Increase housing stability. Streamline permitting and fix incentives. Some things that I have already heard in this room. Yay. <laughs> oh, where'd my page go? Is it in the it's other nice. Chrome tab? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so yeah, we're here to support the work you are already doing. Um, so I'm going to skip past some of these. If this group were to decide, or a portion of this group were to decide that they would want to maybe move towards being a chapter, getting some of our resource, and getting a lot of this work off the ground, the conversations are, appointment, uh, are important, but they are just that conversations. Um, some things that you get. We offer a yearly budget, and for every new member you recruit, we offer, I think, another $15 yearly budget. I think it's $350, but also we have staff members and stuff, as I am one, uh, full-time available to you as a, a bunch of other staff that can help you apply to foundations and grants and get funding for educational events from local banks, that kind of thing. We have these systems that help us search for grants and stuff really efficiently. 
I mean, we can offer that too. So I know Atlanta right now, we just applied for a $40,000 grant um, and it went really well. And I'm talking to someone from a foundation next week who has already pledged $40,000. He just wanted to have coffee with me first. So we're gonna get coffee and then he's gonna write me a $40,000 check, right? <laughs> These are the kinds of things we can help you be doing. Um, also, we have a bunch of tech tools. So, you know, it's awesome that we're all in this room tonight. How do I contact all of you? Well, first of all, I am gonna pass out a piece of paper that you can write your email on. However, if you were to become a chapter, we have Action Network, which is, if anybody's worked with it, uh, a super expensive campaign advocacy type. You can send out emails to people. You can say, click this link and write a letter, and all, all of this stuff is in one place, and you have people's information, if they're a member, if they're just subscribed to the email list, right? Um, so that is like a huge tech thing. We also just have Canva. We have a website that we can build you that's beautiful, right? Like we have all these resources that we can hand off so that when we are talking about, okay, well, this is the action we're gonna take, how do we shoot it off to 500 people we know who might be interested, right? Click of an email on that site, done. And also, you would have a staff member who could write that email for you. Um, another thing, if anybody was like super interested, chapters of the core, right? Like it's got nothing to do with national, but also we offer chapter leadership. So if someone was willing to be like, hey, I, you know, I wanna get the boots on the ground, let's go. Um, we offer extra support and training to those people and you know, ways to organize, how to use our tech tools. Um, and of course, I would be available at your disposal so you can ask questions but there would be a bunch of resources and training for you if you were interested in taking that bigger step into leadership. Um, and I guess I just talked about training and coaching, so we'll skip past that. Um, so you basically make your own local political systems. Like I was saying, it's really just our job to amplify your campaigns and not to decide what you do. Um, you would get to decide like, you know, what this chapter does. Like if we have happy hour a lot, to be honest, we need solidarity, the work is hard. We go to this really cool, like, liberal bar and have beers together and talk about how we're frustrated with zoning 2.0, right? Like, it can be fun stuff. Right, like, but it's like the fun stuff like that. Like, I see it's so important to build that solidarity too. Like, this work is not fun, let's be honest. Like, this keeps me up at night, right? But like, I get to go have a beer with some of my friends in Atlanta who are also pro-housing. So that's nice, and you know, you can do like, Okay, well, are we going to show up to a city hall campaign or city hall meeting for public comment together, right? Like, you kind of get to decide what these are. Um, and you would retain your own local branding. So, if Athens Urbanist had, you know, cute little logos and stuff, you get to use that. Instead of just a Facebook group, we would have a huge website. We would have an Instagram, a Twitter, a Facebook. Well, we already have Facebook. That's always it. <laughs> right? Um, and all this stuff would be, again, run by a staff member. So, you all wouldn't have to worry about it because they pay me to have the capacity to do it. <laughs> um, a little more about the chapter budgets. Whoopsies. Um, here are some free stuff. So you can get business <laughs> cards. We give stickers to everyone. You can get tote bags, t-shirts. Um, we have like really big custom like banner signs that we bring to all of our events so people know who we are. Um, and again, all like super easy to order for us. Let's fill out a form and tell me how many tote bags you want, right? I put in the max amount for the Atlanta chapter. Don't get me wrong. Um, so just like some cool things to also promote, because like who doesn't love a good sticker? Come on, I know this is Athens. Um, and also like discretionary spending, so I kind of talked about this. A base amount, a membership bonus, any local funding we do. Uh, for example, there is a developer in Atlanta who builds tiny cottages. We are doing a ticketed tour of the cottages he has built and splitting the funds, right? And it's not funds that are gonna go to national, the, that's funds for Atlanta. Um, chapter expenditures, if you guys decide you want to book a venue like this, um, this would come out of a chapter expenditure, right? But we would have a lot of ways to increase the money. Um, some spending guidelines, we have a C4 and a C3, so we can do a lot of educational content, but also, as I mentioned, like in Atlanta, we can endorse a candidate. We're not gonna give them money, but we can endorse a candidate and we can use our money to help turn our base out to go phone bank for him and text bank for him. And if one of our members wanted to independently say, we should all give this person money, 
I'm not going to say that, but they would be allowed to say that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just have some different options about how to operate politically here. Um, let's see what else. A little bit about our tech tools. List building. <laughs> this is actually a network that I talked about. Um, nuns need housing. Some really cool... I'm like continue to come up with cool projects that are happening in Atlanta. There are a couple churches um, that are doing Yigby project. Yes, in God's backyard, um, <laughs> right? And they're actually like, there's one church that we we hosted the forum at, and they had purchased extra property so they can make like assisted living units and stuff for seniors in their community who are members of the church or not members of the church. They were just going to open it to you know like 65 plus that kind of thing. Um, which is really cool, especially since churches have tax exemptions and stuff. I'm like, yes, let's use this money for something good, and they are. Um, so, you know, that's another cool outlet. Um, but, yeah, absolutely, this would be, like, a lot of data tracking and stuff, so we could keep track, like, right, you haven't been to a meeting in a while, like, let, let me get you on this, right, and you can look at things like that. Just really helpful from a technical organizing standpoint. Uh, Canva, if you don't know how to be a graphic designer, Canva will teach you how to be a graphic designer. Um, and also we have a bunch of templates, so you wouldn't actually even have to learn. You could just put your pictures in and change the text. Um, so I have made some beautiful graphics that look like, you know, I went to school for graphic design and, you know, like I'm a tech lead. I'm not. They have cool, they have cool templates. And we also just have national staff that are boosting our things. If I have an event in Atlanta, it's posted on the national page. Everyone who follows us over the United States has seen it, right? Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's a little something more. Website infrastructure, I talked about this. Beautiful websites, donation portion, volunteer application, right? You get your events and stuff up here. From the website, you can RSVP through the action network so you can keep track of who's going to turn out. Um, just, yeah, just some beautiful website stuff. Uh, also, Eventbrite, if you're doing a ticketed event, Airtable is this, it is like Google Spreadsheets on crack. There's a lot more, and it's a lot better usage. Um, good, good for data keeping. Um, one password, which is a really secure way to keep all your information. Um, let's see, yeah, a Zoom. And I think what is also really cool is the Slack community. So you would have a Slack with all the people in Georgia. Um, Slack is like a Discord type messaging system, but like for offices, for anyone who might not know. So you can DM people, but there are also channels like I started a sports channel and people nationally who are into housing and also sports like to talk about like the Paralympics with me and stuff, or we post our cats and some of them. But also you would have like these regional Slack channels where you can talk, but there's a bunch of national ones too. So you could be like, wow, I wonder what they're doing, at, you know, in Oregon right now. You would know, um, which I think is really cool because, again, it also builds solidarity. But like, how do I get half my ideas but what other people are doing? I'm like, no, let's try that here. So that's something. Um, we also just, you'll meet a bunch of people across the country. Um, this is some of our staff and leads from last year. This is my bestie, Leora. Um, and again, like you, you also get to weigh in on national decisions. Like we're talking about if we want to endorse Kamala Harris or not, and the staff has been silent on that because our leads have plenty to say about it. And we are happy to defer to their opinions, of course. Um, and just, you know, a network of people who are encouraging each other. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to skip past some of this, but get ideas from the people you know. Um, you can also, you know, do state policy. I can hook y'all up with Atlanta. I can hook y'all up. We're starting Savannah soon, you know what I mean? But also we can talk about things like the federal YIMBY Act, right? And what are we doing to support that across the states? Um, um, we know the state level needs a lot of work. For oh, yeah. Law. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know why this says UGA. Maybe this is because I was working on this. USA. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whoopsies. Go to um, so yeah, this is this is one of our chapters. A bunch of people, our executive director. Um, some more about the training materials. I'm trying to like run through this because it's kind of the boring part, but <laughs> good information to have. Um, just kind of talking about like you know how to talk to reporters, right, or how to give a webinar, or how to have effective public comment. You know, 
and working there, I've learned small things as an organizer. Like, if you're going to ask people to sign a petition, instead of talking about the petition and at the end of the email asking them to sign it, the first thing that you can write <laughs> is sign this petition. So if nobody reads the rest of the email, then they still read the important thing. These are things you would learn if you don't already know. Clearly, I didn't. We live and we learn. <laughs> um, some more coaching. Yeah, like I said, policy, fundraising. Um, some chapter requirements. We have a code of conduct. It's like don't be an ass to each other. Nothing crazy. Don't sexually assault each other. Um, yeah, chapter agreement. Carry out the mission. Affordable and abundant housing, right? Our two prongs there. Um, we're going to talk about using our tech tools. We're going to teach you how. Um, and you're really just committed to people power, right? Um, let's see. Hello? Or is this it? Hello? Maybe this is it. Maybe I didn't know how long my presentation was. <laughs> um, that being said, um, yeah, I could definitely offer you guys a lot of support if folks were interested in either kind of this group being absorbed as a chapter or if some of you were interested in this because I could provide money and time and staff capacity you know i have a lot of people that come with me come to me with event ideas who are like i work three jobs to pay rent but i think this would be a good idea that's awesome i work from home and live with my parents i will make that event happen and i don't necessarily say that as like a point of privilege my mom cooks well i'm glad to live at home for the time being but like again it's part of like well where can i afford to live yeah. the house i grew up in because they're not charging me rent okay <laughs> but you know it is what it is right um, just, you know, the free swag, like the, the, that's a big, that was a big one for me. They're like, you get a tote bag on, sign me up, I'm there. Um, so does anybody have any questions about the possible resources I could offer this group back there with the master shirt on? Could you go back to what makes a group look good fit? Yes. And while we're looking for, for that page, um, there are some folks here who I have never seen in an Athens Urbanist meetup before. Um, welcome. So excited that you're here. Um, when Emma's talking about Athens Urbanist, that's the group that I started two years ago and we have been uh, consistently running um, as an educational group, as a discussion group, mostly. Um, We've been looking for ways to be more active. Um, everyone involved in this group is interested in local politics, local policy, um, local needs, uh, and things that generally make a city work for everyone, um, whether that be transportation, parks, housing is obviously a big one. So, sorry, sorry, guys. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, so, that's a little, just a little bit what Athens Urbanist has been. We are not a 501c3. We are not an organization of any kind. We are a Facebook group and we are people who show up and hang out pretty much once a month. Um, drink beer. We drink beer. We, we have that. <laughs> we could keep doing that. <laughs> we have had some great, we've had some great conversations. We had um, Victor Pope come out and uh, teach us all a lot about the transporta future transportation plan. Um, all that to say, we're talking about a, a, a much more organized thing starting up um and it does not necessarily have to be the end of athens urbanist um i think that the that the scope of athens urbanist goes outside of the scope of umb action in a lot of ways we talk about stuff that is not housing but it has always been very related to housing it's all tied in um and we are also we have also been we had conversations about like, should we be more of an organized group so we can endorse candidates? So we can talk, uh, do more explicitly political action. We have uh, turned that, uh, turned away from that avenue a few times in the past because we, uh, we're a big government town. There are a lot of people who work in governments of various levels who have different restrictions on what they can do and we like having them around. Um, uh, you've talked, did, you say, did you say you work for the 501c3? Or do, do you have a C3 and a C4 in Atlanta? Um, so the national is a C3 and C4. Mm. Um, and so everyone 
gets those. So Atlanta, so a lot of chapters only have C3 funds. Atlanta has both. Um, and then also like just national pays fees and paychecks out of both as well. Did you find the, um, you might be a good fit if? No, that's <laughs> not it. Um, hey, here it is. Yeah. Um, and what's really cool too, like, you know, we talk about big government town. We have some politicians in our group, um, not in Atlanta specifically, but like, uh, we, you know, we have people that are talking about this. We just did a big event um, with Ezra Klein, which was really cool. Um, and, you know, we definitely encourage collaboration with politicians who align with our housing mission. And I think what is so cool, right, is that you could retain Athens Urbanists. Like, we have Urban Environmentalism LA, right? Like, we can retain the name, we can retain the branding, retain the mission even, as long as, you know, it's, like, housing related. And it's never wrong to have, like, other conversations because this is such... An intersectional issue, but I think what's so cool is that UMB Action supports like all different kinds of approaches to this. So whether it be, we're going to talk about the supply issue, we're going to talk about the tax incentives, right? We're going to talk about affordable housing. There are a bunch of ways for us to support you guys in that for what you think is right in your town. Because we're not going to come in and be like, you guys do this in Athens. Like, I lived here, but the staff has no idea what happens here outside of that. And that's the reason why we keep our hands off and just offer you these resources as a way to support. So um, I have a question for everyone, um, uh, which we pulled this page up. Um, I want to talk about the five core solutions um, and see if anyone has any thoughts. Does anyone have, uh, does anyone here think that any of these five core solutions is particularly good or is particularly terrible. Um, I've also got the Yimby action thing pulled up. So if you're like, what do they mean by legalized housing upzoning? I can pull up some of their examples. So the five, the five core solutions, what do we think about them? I'm going to Huh? Let me, let me, let me, let me. So they're, so they're, they're in the middle? They're, they're listed right there. In the middle. Legalized housing. Legalized housing, Legalized housing, housing and upzoning, streamlining permitting, fixing incentives, increasing housing stability, and increasing funds for affordable housing. Um, so I also think increasing housing stability and sustainability is talking a lot about Airbnbs and VRBOs and short term rentals, right? Again, like how does Athens and these niche issues add up to that? Like that to me, I see is, you know, kind of parallel. Um, Personally, but yeah, yeah please, please. The, so the, um, uh, I will say increasing housing stability with the, the longer version of that is um, as, as we advocate for more housing, we advocate strongly for laws that protect tenants and policies that protect vulnerable communities. Um, example, demolition controls requiring builders who tear down existing housing to build new housing, at, at, who, who tear down existing housing to build new housing to build at least as much new housing so you're not tearing down uh, uh, a, part, a six apartment building and making a new single family mansion. That is the that is the example that is given here. There may be other things. So what do we think about these five core solutions? Any particular thoughts or questions? Or does anybody hate them? Uh, yeah. Where would something like making it a reasonable size, like so you don't you can build a shotgun house like in New Orleans, over in New Orleans instead of these like gargantuan like minimum right yeah, so for, like, where does that fit in that that falls into legalizing housing. Okay. Um uh, duplexes I mean so legalizing housing and or fixing incentives, I think. Um oh that's parking requirement. How is parking requirements in there? Anyway. Well absolutely Yeah and and the thing too Yeah upzoning doesn't just mean you can build apartments here now. It also means you can build smaller houses, smaller lots, more and, places. And we can fight these weird zoning laws, right? Like the person I met up with this morning who does the cottages, they're 500 to 900 square feet, even two bedrooms at times. He lives in them while he's developing them around him, right? Um, and we can talk about, you know what I mean? Like what are the diversified housing options? And if you know, something like tiny cottages isn't an option here, are we gonna make it so it can be, right? I know Habitat's working on that right now. 
Yeah. yeah so Habitat um, Habitat um, is doing a project, and uh, would love to, would love to talk to them at some point. Get them to come out and talk about it because we can kind of learn a bit more about how that relates to streamlined permitting. Because the Micah's Creek tiny house community, uh, they had to develop it as a planned development. It had to go through um, many levels and layers of uh, of public discussion, public comment, everyone who lived near them who did not want those kinds of houses there had a chance to come out and complain to the Planning Commission, complain to the Mayor and Commission, um, and potentially shoot down the entire project after Habitat had spent tens of thousands of dollars developing it, at least. Um, so yes, right, like right now, uh, when Habitat is doing something like that, it takes a very, very long time and a lot of money before you even break ground. And none of it is guaranteed because it is all discretionary. And like with the Marin Commission, it depends on where they put it, right? Like if they tried to put that five here, points. five points, and they tried to put it in five points, uh, does the commissioner who represents five points feel differently about small, affordable housing than the commissioner, or whatever point of five point it is, than the commissioner who represents that particular parcel, right? Um, which is how, because, you know, whatever district it's in, that person can often just have a veto and just talk to everyone and be like, hey, don't do this, because a lot of people are complaining to me about having these kinds of people living near us. So that is, um, so yeah. Well, Another thing about it, I was gonna say once it exists, it helps proof of concept to justify Absolutely. to the government yeah. where it would be more Maybe. repeatable. Yeah. Well, and that's why we do things like the tours of the tiny cottages because we can show people like, oh, you don't want an apartment here. Well, we can zone this land and break it up into four pieces with a main house and three tiny cottages. You just need to see that that exists. Yeah. Right. Or even the advocacy, like how many voices in the room are saying, yes, we want these tiny homes in Athens, right? Because there are a lot of very, I would say like 25% of people are like, no, we don't want more housing. And 75% of people are like, yeah, cool. People should afford to be able to like afford a roof over their heads. But that 75% like isn't as loud as the 25% who bitches at city council meetings to be like quite real. Part of what we're doing here is making sure that, and we're not like gonna argue with people who don't want housing, quite frankly. Like that, that is just like not a good use of people's time. We're activating the people who think you should be able to afford to have a roof over your head. We're, we're motivating and inspiring those people to start being the loudest voices in the room. Like Atlanta particularly, we try to be the first people to sign up for public comment. Because if you're gonna say, yes, I think people should be able to afford an apartment in my neighborhood, then the person behind you that says, no, that's a bad idea, honestly looks like an ass. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's part of that too. Like, what are we, how are we putting ourselves in the room? And I think we already have a lot of people here tonight, right? So like, what are we going to go shout about, right? And if we form the group, I will say, so normally groups form because one person reaches out and says, hi, I am interested in starting a chapter and has to like buddy, buddy their friends together, if we have them on a national list, we'll send out like, hi, a chapter has been started in your area. So if we happen to have people that were like members in this area already, they would automatically be notified of a chapter popping up here, right? Um, but the process would be a lot more slow moving. The opportunity that we have is that we already have people in this room and we can immediately get going, right? Like we already have a solid like 20 person list going. So we would be, you know, if you normally start here, we would be starting up here. You know what I mean? Like, we have the drive. Is there only chapter member membership, not individual memberships? Um, no, you can do individual membership, um, and then you basically just, like, are assigned the chapter near you. And um, we have volunteer membership, which there's some parameters, like, every quarter or something like that, you have to show up and help out in an event. Super easy. We also have paid memberships. Some people do like $5 a year or some, you know, we have some corporate partners who are developers who will give us like 10 grand a year. Also a super cool thing, when we decide to support housing projects, community members can send them to us, the developers can send them to us, and our entire team once a week, because this is our most fun meeting, 
gets together, talks about these projects, vets them, and says, do we really think this is something that aligns with us that is going to create affordable and abundant housing? And even if that person is giving us 20 grand, we'll say, no, we're not going to support that if we don't think it's going to do good in the community. I saw your hand first. Yeah, sorry. And I mean, to be clear, I don't personally care about this, but in case we might get hung up on it later, could you just talk about sources of funding so that that's... Yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, kind of as I mentioned, we're going to start off with a... No, not for us, for the national organization. Where oh. does the money come from? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot, so a lot of our money does come from membership donations. Um, we do have a lot of corporate members, um, you know, businesses who will donate and stuff. Uh, we get a lot of grant and foundation funding. Um, some of it is not necessarily like federal grants, but you know, like if there's a group out in San Francisco that has $35,000, you know what I mean? That comes to the national group. Um, I can definitely, so they were like, Hey, follow up with a budget. Um, so if you're interested in knowing more, I can definitely follow up with well, you. Just look, but would it, would it be fair to say that I quickly look on the website? It's like half individual money. Uh, like 20, 25% grants, and then like another 20, 25% corporate, which let's be clear, does mostly mean developers. And I think developers are fine, by the way. But sure, yeah. Um, to be completely frank with you, I don't know what the actual percentages are. I know much more about the local um, chapter budgets, yeah. but it does, right, there are like a lot of, it is a lot of individual membership, corporate membership, and foundations are like the main three points there. And again, to be very clear, just because a corporate partner gives us money does not mean we are bending to their will. We are so against that. Okay. Um, right. And but, so anyway, just, just very quickly, Google AI, 69% individuals, 6% foundations, the 25% corporate. Yeah, so that's... Yeah. Google AI knows more about my company than me. Okay. Well, this is, see, I have, and I have daily meetings with, like, the fundraising team and stuff, You're right? Funded. You're funded. Okay, we good. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we You're have money to offer, and yeah. we can help you get more money. Right. Um, I, so we have, like, 20 minutes left. I'll take a question. I was just going to say, um, so you had talked about, like, at a national level, there's the ability for developers to submit plans. It, do you have any chapters that have like, a portal on their website where local developers can submit their plans to garner support from like the local chapter? Because I, I could see a world in which like developers submitted their plans to us and we reviewed them and, and gave them suggestions and said, if you make these changes, we will come out and support your plans. Like, mm. if you add some affordable housing, sure. if you add some, like, these trends, whatever. Like, yeah. is that something anyone does? Um, let me talk a little bit more about our approval process. So there's one portal that anyone submits. This could be a person who's building an ADU on their property. This could be a small developer. This could literally just be someone who I went to a city council zoning committee meeting, and I heard about this and am interested in gaining support for it, right? All of our national staff looks at it together, including myself, our national chapter managers. Um, we have a legal team and we all look at it together and we decide, do we want to approve this project or no? If we decide to approve the project, what we do is we assign it for activism. That means the project and all of its data points are gonna get kicked back to the local chapter to look at it and then you guys get to decide. So if you hate the project, you don't need to do anything with it. That's not like, right. I approved it, but that's not my business, whether you, you know, you go for it or not. But if you decide, Hey, this looks really good. Like let's show up to the zoning committee meeting about this. Then that's up to you. All that we're doing is approving them to say, yes, these align with our mission. Now you can take a look and decide if you want to act on this or not. Um, and that goes right. Like that's, it just gets assigned nationally. And also it gets assigned a staff member and stuff to keep up with it too. So if, you know, we wanted to backtrack or, you know, we didn't know when the next hearing was, like, that is something I would know as someone who's assigned to the project. So, does that kind of answer your question? Does it have to be submitted by the developer? Or nope. Yeah, why don't you can do it? Like, you could literally hear about it at a zoning committee meeting and be like, that sounded really cool. Um, 
Also, what's really cool, I mentioned our legal team. Um, we've, like, sued the city of Los Angeles um, and won, uh, which is really cool, too, because, you know, you sue the city and then you get all this money, which is also part of our funding, right? Because we basically do, like, unpaid We I do not do it. The legal team does unpaid legal work and then gets the kickback and, you know, the, the win money. Um, but we also do things like we'll send letters, we'll send legal letters to the city, um, and that's also part of our project. What was the lawsuit about? Do you know? Um, Denial they, of, a, of a... Yeah, basically, like, they, they had, right, like, they had a, um, a law come out about, like, you know, it was, like, a zoning law type thing. I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, but it was a but, but yeah, essentially, um, well, no, not even. So it made it more possible to build housing, like, across the state. But the city of L.A. was like, mm, we're not going to let you break up your lot like that. And so Yimby Action Legal came in and said, uh, actually, they are. So we're going to sue you for denying them that right, right? Because that right is now protected under like a new affordable abundant housing type law. Um, we've won multiple of those, which is really cool. And I think it's so badass for our legal team to be like, we sued the city of Los Angeles, which is why I said it like that too. <laughs> but, you know... It happens a little less in the South, but like the legal team is also on those project approval calls. You know what I mean? Like they know what's up to and if they need to get involved. Happy to take any other questions about anything at this point. <laughs> what's up, Vaughn? Could you speak to um, like work with coalitions? Because I feel like I saw that. And yes. And how does that relate to the chapter structure? Yeah. Um, so one thing we have local coalitions, right? Um, so for Atlanta, we have our membership base and we have our corporate membership base. Right now, I am fostering a relationship with a youth action group in Atlanta and they specifically train younger people, I'm gonna use this hesitantly, like 30 and under. Please don't think you're old if that's <laughs> no, not you. That is not what I'm saying. <laughs> how to do this advocacy and stuff. So now when I have a developer say, hi, I have this project coming up, I'm gonna to turn to Jen from the Youth Action Board and say, Jen, you know those people that you trained last week? Let's send them out to the public hearing. Let's put those skills to the test, not to the test, but like to use, right? And that's right, like the, there's a partnership there. So it's really about like what you can offer each other and also things like list building. We're doing that open house tour. Both of us are gonna get the attendee list for that um, or split the money for that, right? Like, and also we're trying to, um, you know, they hired me in Georgia so we can start doing like statewide work more, right? So that we can have that intercommunication, not just between like, you know, if we wanna do Athens Urbanists and Abundant Housing Atlanta, but also, you know, like what are, what are other groups in the area doing? Um, we do a lot with Atlanta Land Trust and we do a lot with groups that um, kind of identify the immediate needs, like paid back rent and whatnot. So even though we're a little more on the supply side, we're being sure that like current tenants are being taken care of, right? Um, some of our members are like land use attorneys and stuff. Um, so really about like building capacity. How do you how do you help with the tenant groups? Um, I mean, a lot of it is support you know, supporting them and boosting their events, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of it does lie in marketing and also turning our own membership base out for that um, and just being sure that people are aware that there's kind of different prongs of the work going on. Because I'm not going to be like, don't go volunteer with Atlanta Land Trust. The more you want to do, the better, please. Like, the more the merrier. Um, so it's really, it's a little, for that stuff specifically, it's a little more in marketing. Um, but again, list growth if you do an event together, splitting the funds if you do a ticketed event together. Um, mm. But we, we do try to be sure that we support those groups because it needs, right, it needs to be a full circle. Like, what are we doing for people who are struggling to keep their homes right now, too? So I know there's a lot of people in this room right now who actually already work in this space. And I'm wondering if some of y'all that do would be willing to just talk about what you do and then if you see this organization being helpful at all, and it's okay if you so, oh, yeah. I know some of you already work in this space. I'd love to hear from you. I quickly 
I mean, you you said you know that there's a developer that's really into building affordable housing, not so much on the profit side. I definitely want to talk to you about that. Okay. Um. Yeah. Not, I can. Not so much now because mm -hmm. it takes up time. I, <laughs> I can give you a site. His name is Eric Kronberg. Um. And he. Later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> does cool stuff. I'll write down his name for you. I'll share it all. I'm working with. I mean, I, so I work doing street outreach with house folks, and then the chair of our local continuum of care, homeless continuum of care, homeless services. But trying to do like power building and coalition building amongst people who are currently homeless or with lived experience of homelessness is something that we want to do to try to build power with folks, build dialogue with folks. Obviously, folks who don't have a roof over their head are very upset about not having a roof over their head and not having opportunity or not knowing who to be mad at. Sometimes they channel that anger at us, the service providers, which is warranted because we're part of the system in a way. Um, at the same time, there's, there's clearly bigger systemic forces at play here so like trying to build political education um, and more solidarity amongst folks uh, about the kind of communal struggles that we're all experiencing in front of but some more than others but having like I, whether it's this or some form of ways to be doing like political education and advocacy with those folks um, and giving them tangible spaces to be part of larger groups i know like one of my co-workers has started uh, movement narrative storytelling group at the Homeless Day Center where Ooh. people are coming together and sharing stories and learning how can they, you know, the narrative about them is that they're lazy or dirty or this or that and that's often internalized, left alone. How can you, what's your narrative and how can you build your own narrative about what your experience has been like and then what are ways to like tangibly push that narrative out in the community so these other negative perceptions or stereotypes aren't thrown onto you. Um, and that group last Friday in the group said, well, where's a meeting we can go to? And so they pulled up at the land use planning meeting that earlier this week and sat in the back and there wasn't room for public comment. And I'm sure that they didn't, the, some of those people were probably like, what the hell are these people talking about? But um, ultimately, how can we make our conversations around housing more inclusive so that when we have meetings about homelessness, or meetings about housing, or meetings about land use, if someone who is homeless, or if someone who has been homeless before doesn't raise their hand at the end of the meeting and say, so what are y'all gonna do about housing? Because I've also heard that happen a couple times in meetings about homelessness and housing. Um, but how do we create room for those people that really are part of the development discussion to be also be part of land use, housing, and development discussions mm -hmm. as well? And that's so important to us, is diversifying the voice in the movement, right? Because like, I have this secure job at this point, and I've never worried about housing over my head, right? But I'm gonna let the people that have this expertise from lived experience kind of, you know what I mean, like guide the mission. And I think that, like I said, boosting those is really important. We send out blog posts. I help support people in doing like op-eds and the AJC and stuff. Um, and I'm gonna pass this around. I got this this morning. Someone did a children's book. Um, so if you want to take a look, I thought it was kind of silly, but, but there are a lot of different options in terms of like, yeah, how do we be sure that everyone knows that narrative so that we're having these conversations, it's not coming from a place of hate and stereotypes. And it's, I just so, this is just my, I'll just throw this in, it's so wild to me that, like, even for, like, we had an affordable housing investment strategy and we had a homeless investment strategy, and the conversation about housing is is always like structurally separate and distinct from the conversation about homelessness and it's like this is this is weird <laughs> this is one thing so were you aware that there was a hotel some couple of years back that was for sale on Atlanta highway that they were looking at the lady really wanted to sell a hotel for homelessness and offered it to the city but they didn't move on I, that was my day before my time, but I ran a hotel program for three years um, with my agency that was very successful and it has since ended because it turns out $90 a night isn't sustainable. Hmm. You know, when you don't own the hotel, you had to pay for it and it's not going to be sustainable. Yeah, so. I'll talk to you about it. Okay. We got about 10 minutes. Any other oh, yeah. questions I can answer? What do you want to hear about? Okay, so, hey, everybody, Scott, I'm with Envision Athens. Um, 
Right now, I'm serving as the chair of the Athens Homeless Coalition and have done a lot of work in bringing that organization forward. And we're at the part where we're getting our feet on the ground. There's a lot of funding from ARPA funding through December 2026. But um, as that organization is getting its feet on the ground, we're the core stream focus, streamlined focus on, on homelessness, but you can't not talk about housing if you're not, yeah, and I totally agree with you, Sarah. It's been separate for some stupid reason, but anyway, so as that organization evolves, especially their executive director, Michael Bean, is looking towards creating groups of folks to talk more about housing, affordable housing, whatever that means to whoever you talk to. Um, so that is becoming more streamlined. Um, so this is exciting because I get to sit in rooms like I get to sit in the GIC room and I get to sit, you know, and listen to all the American Mission talk about it and then the Athens Homeless Coalition and so getting to able to sit in all these spaces and see everybody's kind of like momentum but then not at the same time because you keep butting up against things that you feel like can't be pushed. This is exciting for me because the things that can be pushed I think are systems that have been built in for some reason that don't make sense mm -hmm. and so if it takes a lawyer to be like why does this why are we doing it this way then that's what we need to do and i don't i haven't seen anywhere in athens where that capacity is there to be like let's bring in some some for lack of a better word, hire being attorney whatever to be yeah. like oh, this doesn't make sense why are we doing this so it's done. this is exciting we, yeah, we've got to change our current. Yeah. We have legal staff members. We have event planning staff members. We have grant and individual and corporate uh, funding staff members. Like we, anything you think of. Um, just to respond to your question, my name is Imani Scott Blackwell. I'm one of the founders of the High Mind Community Investment Cooperative. Um, we've been working for two years and are in a soft launch period now. We actually began in response to the Prosperity Capital Partners purchase a few years back that displaced hundreds of people. Um, after working with Emma and other organizers with folks directly and really seeing at that time that there was, because of a lot of um, assistance at that time was focused on COVID, there was just this massive gap of their social safety net was not showing up for these folks and their families. Um, and there was a multi-month campaign and to watch the residents, uh, there was a lot of mutual aid support of them directly uh, helping each other move. It was extremely powerful because, you know, it was really disappointing to see that no one was coming to save them. You know, the American Commission were like, there's not really anything we could do. That was the, the local nonprofit, and yeah. their hands were tied. There was nothing that they could do. And so at that point, I was literally, I always tell the story as me manically Googling in the middle of the night, like real estate development cooperative, mm -hmm. is that a thing? Do people do that? And they do. <laughs> in different places across the country, they are doing that. And so um, looking at some of these different models, I wanted to ask about the Guild and Atlanta if you'll have a relationship because that would be probably the closest to us. Um, they call it a community stewardship trust is what they're at the model that they're testing, but folks looking to be able to collectively raise capital and uh, acquire properties and steward them together, um, and community-led investment. And particularly um, after, I think it was in 2013, there was some change, in, and we're getting out of my expertise, but some SEC uh, <laughs> laws around um, real estate investment. So before that point, individuals that were not um, accredited investors, so meaning like, I think more than 200,000 annual income and a certain amount of wealth were not eligible to invest mm -hmm. in real estate development projects, but that shifted in 2013. That is now permitted up to a certain amount, maybe $10,000 per individual. And so um, we've started a, we're looking at the DCIF model in particular. It's the Diversified Community Investment Fund that essentially is a real estate investment fund that allows individuals in the community to invest in projects together. Um, and it's both primarily a real estate fund, but you also can invest in small business projects. And so one thing that we've talked about, um, there's just so much in the housing space to be done around the actual development itself. I'm really interested in the uh, capital raise um, and bringing more money and capital <laughs> into Athens because uh, like starting as a student organizer is one thing, but now I have learned and <laughs> seen some of what's happening across 
the country, and like I'm not gonna keep fighting with people over twenty five thousand dollars. <laughs> I'm not gonna put in uh, so much work with the city to get fifty thousand dollars. It just doesn't make sense <laughs> at this point. Um, so looking at how can we really attract more capital, especially off of you know the the expertise and you know the innovation that is really like community bred. And so um, I'm interested in like. The existence of this group or some type of relationship in a coalition type com uh, capacity because we have talked about the fact that there is a zoning component of obviously the housing crisis um, and so to have as we all kind of carve off what is our piece of this collective pie um, i think this is definitely one that needs to exist certainly so i'm curious yeah about what folks in this group are thinking about moving forward and how we can just make sure that there's not a duplication of efforts there because it is, it's like necessary. So we're willing to build it in and have had some uh, meetings with Spencer Fry about uh, also specific asking for this kind of zoning support as something that's missing in the ecosystem mm -hmm. right now. Um, and so I think there definitely is a role for it. It just depends on where it will be housed. Yeah. Um, and happy to, I'd hope to talk more, you know, about all of these things over time. But I'm happy to be here. It's the first meeting I've been able. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that's all super cool. I have so much respect for you. When I was talking to my boss about the stuff in Athens, I was like, you know, there is this organizer in Athens who is Googling <laughs> how to make a land for us. And I was like, Let, can we please give these people money? Like, you know what I mean? And thinking of you. Um, so so much respect for that and I definitely think there is a huge space for that just to speak to some of like the back end of overlapping work we track all of our coalition relationships in again this like very elongated <laughs> data entry process so that we know who is doing what and when updating what events they're having what we're working on together so just from more of the back end it is all somewhere it is all somewhere online so I think we have at least three people who would be willing to be leaders in this. What is the process for us taking the urbanists and like do people generally like vote if they want to do this thing? Do we whoever wants to join it kind of joins it and then some people are just Athens Urbanist Facebook members and some people are part of this like other thing as well? Like what's the Sure how do we take that step? Um so a couple things. I would honestly probably have you fill out a chapter address form just so it shows up. It's like yeah. five questions. Just show it shows up in our database. Um, if you are interested in being in leadership, I'll go ahead and put a star by your name. I'm I will follow up with everyone either very late tonight or tomorrow, <laughs> and I will give you a leadership form to go ahead and fill out. If anyone is just interested in being like a pain or a volunteer member, I am also happy to send you that link and I will make a note of that. Additionally, if you just want to be on the email list and know what's up, that is also an option. I don't know how Athens Urbanist typically makes decisions, but really, I just need an interest form. Yeah, and I can follow so, up with all of you on that. Yeah, so basically um, what, I'm, what I'm hearing from our very, very next steps um, because we are running close to time. Um, uh, how does Athens Urbanist make decisions? Uh, for a while it was just me, and then I recruited some other folks to talk to. Uh, so, uh, so I'm, think I'm thinking, I, having heard, and I'm so glad that we had so many people here, um, so many different people, different perspectives, um, and got to hear more about this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you that form. I'm going to get you an interest yeah. form. We've got the names of the people here. We've got a lot of people who are interested but couldn't be here. Um, I think we're going to move forward with something. Do you have a question? It's more so just a general comment. It'll take 60 seconds. You guys are getting here out of time. <laughs> but I just wanted to make it clear that I'm here with Red and Black. Um, some of you guys gave some really good comments, and I'm going to come up to you and ask if that's okay to be like published and everything like that. Um, so I know a couple of you guys talked, so I'm just going to come up to you guys. I'm also trying to cover more homelessness stuff that's happening in Athens, in like a hopefully like a solutions based kind of way, like a means to an end type of thing. So I would definitely would like to talk to some of you guys about that. 
and not trying to all to interrupt. No, yeah, the, no, it's, it's this is yes. part of the narrative yes. shift around. Yes, now, so yes, so please important. talk to our oh, journalists you to before be you leave. Um, uh, so yes, so we're gonna. Can I snatch my notebook back from you? Uh, yes. Was there anyone who wanted to sign up who didn't get a chance? Okay. Um, pass it back around for anyone who wanted to sign up but did not get a chance. Uh, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna move and forward. I'm part of the Facebook group. Join the Facebook group. Uh, yeah, make a Facebook. Um, uh, so thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Emma. Um, that was uh, amazing. It was so nice to be back in Athens. I miss this community. I walked through the arch. I miss it here. So this was, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, um, wait, oh, let's, uh, wait, wait, <laughs> no, yeah. One last comment. That, yep. You know, uh, Big Money has seen just how profitable housing is, and now we've got you know corporations that have gotten into purchasing homes nationwide, All right? And buying up a lot of houses. Is your organization addressing that in any manner? Or looking at it? Um, I I think something. I don't know if this is necessarily and exactly I mean, they, an I mean, answer, right? And, and they're throwing crazy money at homes in areas. that's driving up right. The rate, the cost so of so one thing we fight is predatory investment. The kind of the kind of investors we're working with are people who are doing percentage affordable ADUs, not for profit. We do not believe in predatory investment for one. Uh, um, yeah. And additionally, like I said, all of our projects that come through, if it's someone corporate, I don't care if you gave us twenty grand. If we don't agree with what you're doing, we're not supporting. But I mean, are y'all looking at these corporations to maybe? Because there's no legislation out there. Yeah, I mean, so I, th I think more the approach is like, like I was saying in Atlanta, like homes are being appraised at like 20% or whatever for big corporations. So we're more attacking the city side being like, hello, you need to appraise these at full value if you're going to do other people's homes. Yeah. yeah. You um, see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. I, I would love to have it. But you, I haven't heard from you yet. What's... Um, I'm curious if your organization is transparent about who your corporate sponsors and donors are. Yep. And also about your board members and their backgrounds. Um, yes, we have a national board and you can totally have a regional board as well. Um, we have all of our board members. Can you tell me your name? Uh, I'm Jeremy. Jeremy, okay. I'm going to get back to you with an email and your name is on this list. It is not. You can give it to me. I'm Sally. Okay, um, I will be sure that Sally gets a list of our board members to you on the national level, um, and we're definitely very open about who is in our corporate partnerships group and whatnot, um, you know, locally and all that, but also, you know, just who we're getting money. I like, I don't, there's really, we're not trying to hide anything, truly, um, but I can definitely follow up with Sally with some more details, you know, follow up with my team for some more details and be sure that that gets to you because the transparency is like just as important to me because I'm not, I don't vibe with like taking dirty money. Um, so. Really? So okay, I'm not providing dirty money. <laughs> I, I know this is like, not exactly the answer you wanted, but like, yes, our board members are out there. Like, yes, the people who support us are out there and I'm happy to give you a more specific list just so you know what's up. Yeah, let's let's break there. Yeah. We will, we, uh, we will organize more We'll have more, uh, more of this, more to come, more action You'll, you moving will hear forward. From and right now, let's, uh, yep. everyone will hear from Emma. Yeah, uh, you'll all hear from me in an email very late tonight or tomorrow morning. Yes. Yeah.